Good evening. My name is Dr. Scott Cameron. I serve as the Section Head of Vascular Medicine. I'm a vascular cardiologist and I have the privilege to introducing to you a distinguished panel of physicians and surgeons that form our comprehensive treatment team for peripheral artery disease. So immediately to my left, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Luke Laffin, uh, who's from the Preventive Cardiology Section. Immediately to his left, I'd like to introduce Dr. Teresa Wu, who's from the Vascular Medicine Section. Immediately to her left, I'd like to introduce Dr. Aravinda Nanjun Dapa, who's an interventional cardiologist, and he divides his time equally between cardiology and vascular medicine. And immediately to his left, I'd like to introduce Dr. John Quartramoni, who's one of our distinguished vascular surgeons. So if I could just um, open it up and um, discuss some things that general physicians and sometimes patients are not always aware, that when you're walking, you may have some narrowing in the arteries in the legs, Everyone's familiar with the concept of narrowing in arteries in the heart that can cause a heart attack, for example. But not everyone knows that, in fact, if you've got narrowing in the arteries in the leg, not only can it be painful while you're walking, but that actually increases your heart attack risk and your stroke risk. And it turns out that recognizing those symptoms might suggest you have peripheral artery disease is the first step. And once that you've recognized it, um, you may want to think about, is this something that needs to be treated medically? Is this something that needs to be treated, for example, by placing a stent to open up a narrowed artery? Or is this something that's serious enough that actually requires a very open but very highly skilled surgical procedure here at the Cleveland Clinic? So firstly, I'd just like to call on Dr. Teresa Wu. If you could maybe tell us what your practice patterns been when you have patients referred to you for peripheral artery disease, what are their typical symptoms and what are the first tests that you would do? Um, yes, of course. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me. I think this is great to be among so many faces from different departments to talk about such an important topic. Um, and to echo you know, what you had just mentioned, um, I think screening is something that, um, that is under-discussed, but I think is so important because you know, globally, PAD, or peripheral artery disease, affects about 12% of the population, but in high-risk groups, this can be as high as 20%. And, um, and as you mentioned, about, about half of these patients do suffer from coronary or cerebrovascular disease, which are huge causes of morbidity and mortality in these patients. So you know, I think as providers, uh, as all providers, we should be proactive in screening these patients, and especially those who are high risk for peripheral artery disease. Um, so, uh, and the kinds of patients that we tend to see this in are um, patients who are over 65 and also those under 65 with risk factors, and that includes things like diabetes, um, atherosclerosis in another vascular bed, so for example with coronary disease, um, hypertension, CKD, and, um, and this is also supported by the most recent guidelines um, that supports screening in, the, in these patients. And, um, and so the way that we do that um, is um, we can order something called an ankle brachial index or an ABI, and uh, what that basically um, means is that the, well, we take the higher of the two blood pressures obtained in the uh, ankle on one limb divided by the higher of the two blood pressures obtained in the arms. And um, we use that as a, a type of a screening test. Um, if that is not done, then I, at the very least, I think comprehensive clinical screening should be done. And that's supported by the recent guidelines as well. So that involves doing a thorough history taking, asking about symptoms of claudication, um, doing a good pulse exam and checking blood pressures in both arms at the very least, but um, the kind of step beyond that that we traditionally use is the ankle brachial index. Wonderful. Well, let me ask you a question. Dr. Laffin, um, you are a distinguished investigator as well as a physician, and one of the things that I know that the preventive cardiology section does particularly well is looks at things, for example, optimizing blood pressure, optimizing lipids but there's a special tool that you've got in your armamentarium that I don't think everyone's available or they know about. Tell us a little bit about supervised exercise training. Yeah, I think that's a great point, uh, Dr. Cameron. Um, supervised exercise training is covered by CMS and it's essentially cardiac rehabilitation, but for patients with peripheral arterial disease. Um, and we know that cardiac rehabilitation is under, under prescribed Supervised exercise therapy is vastly underprescribed in this population. Um, and it's, it's very similar. It's an exercise and educational program for 36 sessions. And so it's not just going down and walking on a treadmill. It's more than that, okay? Working with nurses, exercise physiologists, 
um, to not only get people to the point where they're um, actually achieving claudication in their legs and hopefully improving it, but also working on risk factors, getting them hooked up with smoking cessation resources, making sure they have the dietary resources, speaking with our nutritionists, et cetera, and making sure their risk factors are controlled, like blood pressure, like cholesterol. Um, so covered, vastly underprescribed, um, and patients derive so much benefit from it. Fantastic. Um, I might skip over to Dr. Quattromoni. So we've shared many patients together and I know one of the things um, that you always emphasize, which we greatly appreciate, is we have such a fantastic working relationship between the different departments at the Cleveland Clinic and vascular surgery is well aware of all the screening tests, of course, as well as medications to help patients with peripheral artery disease. Can you maybe tell us what your practice pattern has been for that patient who might have been medically optimized but is still having severe pain when they walk, for example, but they've not gotten to the point where they have tissue breakdown. Um, how would you have a conversation with a patient about things that you can offer? I think everybody's a little bit different. Uh, and in that situation, you, sorry, you said that they had been optimized already? So I think that, that that's the first discussion, is making sure that all their medications are optimized and that they're aware of things, uh, resources that we have to offer, smoking cessation counselors. Um, plugging them into the system. And I do talk to them about structured exercise therapy as an option. Uh, and kind of one of the hurdles I found is that, you know, we certainly have that resource locally, but kind of getting them plugged in, maybe if they're uh, geographically, um, maybe a little bit further away, you know, that seems to be uh, a common problem that, that, I, that I face. But I think it's kind of about working together to, from both the medicine side as well as getting them involved in that kind of program, I think is, is important. And you know, sometimes a referral will come to us because a patient has a wound in the leg and it's sometimes challenging for us to tell, is this wound because they've got untreated diabetes, for example, or undertreated diabetes? Is it because that the blood vessels coming out of the legs, the veins are not working properly? Or is it because that the blood flow isn't what it should be going into the legs, the arteries? Dr. Nanjandapa, you see many patients with tissue loss in wounds and ulcers, for example, that are caused by peripheral artery disease. I wonder if you could maybe tell us um, some of the things that you've been able to do for patients to help those uh, wounds heal when medications otherwise can't do that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Cameron, for involving me with this. And I'm honored to be with the esteemed panel of guests here. These patients, were, as you mentioned, we call the term as CLI, which is critical in ischemia, and the, even the fancier term is the, the CLTI. But so these patients basically are at high risk for losing the limb. Basically, as Dr. Wu mentioned, their ankle brachial index is typically less than 0.4. What it means is they have a multi-level disease. They may have a iotoiliac disease, SFA, popliteal disease, below knee artery disease. Typically, these are all total blockages and total occlusions. The first thing I do is uh, try to summarize all the things that we talked about uh, from what Dr. Kothramoni, Dr. La Luke Lefkin said, and also what uh, Dr. Wu is mentioning about maximizing medical therapy, the short mnemonic I form is A, B, C, D, E. A is for aspirin, B for beta blocker, if they have heart disease, C for cholesterol management, D for diabetes uh, management, E is education, which involves supervised exercise program, also for tobacco cessation, and education about the disease itself, because they have a high risk for heart disease and stroke. So once I would touch base with them, we don't have much time, so we kind of have to move fast because the wound can get worse, rest pain can become a limb loss. So such patients, we do try to schedule for a, what is called an angiogram based on what kind of uh, imaging we already have, whether they have an ABI or a CT scan. And at the imaging, we kind of have to pause and uh, have a multidisciplinary approach. What I mean by that is, can a vascular surgeon provide a good long bypass, especially if there's a good piece of vein with the recent clinical data showing in the basal trial that if you have a long piece of vein, the person does, patient does well, the long-term outcomes are good. But typically in diabetes patients and regional disease, they may not be able to find a long vein, they may not be good targets. Such patients, we do offer endovascular approach and at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter whether I do it or my colleague, Dr. Quatramoni does, or the radiology people does, it's at the end of the day who can get the best option for the patient. And typically you want to establish a straight inflow. That means just not treating a iliac disease by me is not enough. You got to come from top to bottom and establish a palpable pulse at the end of the procedure. 
Sometimes it's a hybrid procedure. I can offer what I mean is Sean Lydon may do a common femoral endarterectomy and then at the same time do a balloon angioplasty or I may work with him and establish the flow. Sometimes we stick the leg and the groin together and establish a flow. It's called the pedal axis. Rarely, if all this fails, uh, Dr. Lydon is still the principal investigator for a trial where we call deep vein revascularization. We puncture the artery to the vein and put stent so that patient forms a loop of blood flow to keep the foot alive. So you've got to go all extreme to get it done. Sometimes those intervascular procedure fails, but still we can do a bypass. Two short points I want to touch base is I'm only a plumber. I can fix what I can, but you need a multidisciplinary approach. What I mean by that is uh, doctors like you and Dr. Wu can help me to do what is the best antithrombotic therapy, antiplatelet therapy, endocrinologist to help in diabetes management, vascular surgery to help us with um, further any more things to be done, wound care for wound debridement, and sometimes the podiatrist plays a big role to help us in uh, seeing how much more blood supply we need or what we have done is enough. And of course, if things don't turn out to be well at some point, even some partial amputation, so that wound doesn't spread and cause gangrene. So, and a regular follow-up is needed too. Well, that's a nice segue actually to, to go firstly back to Dr. Wood and Dr. Quattromoni. Um, you talked a little bit about an angiogram, which is a test that you can use by accessing a blood vessel, sometimes in the wrist, sometimes in the groin, and it allows you to see um, where there are blockages in, in arteries. Of course, that's an invasive test. Um, Dr. Will, I wonder if you could maybe tell us a little bit about the collaborative vascular lab that's run between vascular medicine and vascular surgery, where we can use uh, a non-invasive test to sometimes tell exactly what's going on. Tell us your expertise there. Yeah, of course. So, you know, we have a great vascular lab um, that operates between a collaboration between vascular medicine and vascular surgery, um, where we can do a lot of non-invasive kind of testing to um, not just screen for vascular disease, but also um, perform surveillance of, of, of vascular disease, whether or not it's before or after a procedure or, um, or a surgery is done. And so what that can look like is not just an, a an ABI, which uh, we had talked about earlier, but also we do um, arterial duplex ultrasound to take a look at specifically the anatomy of the vessels. And um, it's a great tool that we also have for surveillance after, after any sort of procedure um, or surgery. Got it. And Dr. Quartermoni, for patients that are watching, I wonder if you could tell us what expectations would be for recovery time if someone has required to undergo a surgical procedure and how you would utilize our well-acclaimed vascular lab at Cleveland Clinic for surveying those, those vessels and stents to make sure they're still open. Sure. So after, typically after an open revascularization, it's, I think it's reasonable if everything goes well uh, to be in the hospital for three to five days. Uh, sometimes patients uh, would benefit from physical therapy and they can go to a facility to get stronger for a little while. But once you have that initial experience of the operation, it really starts a lifelong relationship where surveillance is very important. And uh, uh, typically they'll, patients will come into the office and it's very convenient. They'll have their, their duplex ultrasound following their bypass, their ankle brachial brachial index at that time, uh, and we kind of set up a regular uh, surveillance regimen in line with SVS guidelines to make sure that if there is a issue that's developing, that we can catch it uh, ahead of time and uh, do something about it. But uh, typically, that three to five day range uh, is reasonable to expect in the hospital after that surgery. Got it. Well, one of the things we heard about, um, this is one extreme where a patient requires a procedure in order to restore blood flow. But for those patients who might have peripheral artery disease and need risk factor reduction and maybe um, supervised exercise training to get them out of pain, I wonder, Dr. Laffin, if I could come back to you, because we know that all patients with peripheral artery disease should be on an antiplatelet therapy consisting of either aspirin or clopidogrel in most cases. They should be on a statin medication. They should be on an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker, according to established guidelines. Those last two medicines, of course, are helpful for, for blood pressure. Could you maybe give us a little bit more information on your section's particular expertise for those patients whose LDL bad cholesterol really doesn't get down to target or they're having a lot of off-target effects? I sometimes find patients are hesitant to take statin medications. And there are other classes of medicines we can use. I wonder if you could please tell us about those. Definitely. Um, so as many people know, peripheral arterial disease is equivalent, when we think about it, to coronary artery disease. And it, these are secondary prevention patients. So we need to use all the tools in our toolbox to actually lower LDL cholesterol. 
That includes maximally tolerated doses of statins, as you alluded to. That's the gold standard, but there's much more available. Um, we have medicines that have been around for quite a while, like azetamide, brand name is Zetia, um, which you can take, lowers LDL cholesterol by an additional 20 to 25%. Uh, there's a newer medicine called bempidoic acid, which is also oral, which lowers LDL cholesterol also by 20 to 25%. Um, there are injectable medicines, specifically monoclonal antibody PCSK9 inhibitors, um, and the names for those are alirocumab and evolocumab, and they have a, a very prominent reduction in LDL cholesterol, you know, almost 60% in most cases, um, and those are oftentimes a good um, scenario in folks that have statin-associated muscle symptoms or an intolerance. And then a newer medicine as well is called inclycerin, and that's a short interfering RNA. Um, and the nice part about that is that's an injection you can get every six months in the office. So for those patients that may be more likely to be non-adherent um, is a good, uh, good potential option, and that lowers LDL cholesterol by 50%. Um, and what we try and target is LDL cholesterol at least less than 70, but actually more recent guidelines, particularly European guidelines, pushing that even lower to LDL cholesterol less than 55. Um, as I like to say, uh, lower is better, lowest is best when it comes to LDL cholesterol reduction. That's always a question, how low do you go? Patients sometimes say, isn't that a little bit too low, doctor? What do you respond when you hear that question? So I, I tell them about the data um, from the uh, Fourier and Odyssey trial, right? Looking at the difference between alirocumab and evolocumab. Um, and to refresh folks, um, with alirocumab, they thought, well, maybe we are going too low with the LDL cholesterol, so let's dose reduce. And guess what? Their hazard ratio wasn't as good, okay? So actually it doesn't look like it was quite as effective in the trial when both medicines are pretty equivalent, um, but lower is better in that scenario. In all practicality, if we get into the low single, the single digits for LDL cholesterol, then I might say, yes, you can cut your statin, receive a statin from 40 to 20, um, but we're definitely not getting people off of it at that point. Yes. I wonder, uh, Dr. Wu, I'd like to touch base a little bit on an additional class of medications that our vascular physicians use quite often, um, anti-thrombotic therapy consisting of anticoagulants. Now, as it turns out that someone who has peripheral artery disease, so disease in the arteries in the leg, if they also have heart disease, with or without disease in the brain, if it's a patient that's had a stroke, um, there is another medication, rivaroxaban, in a dose that I think some physicians may not be familiar with its availability and some patients may not know about it. Tell us a little bit about that medication and how we've used that to optimize care and prevent heart attacks and strokes with people who've got narrowed arteries in the leg. Um, of course. So, um, you know, so you mentioned um, uh, vascular disease in more than one area. And so um, we call that uh, polyvascular disease sometimes. And this is a concept that we use to define vascular disease in more than one bed. And as you mentioned, this is important because we know that um, this is associated with an even increased risk in things like heart attack and stroke. And so when it comes to managing these patients, um, we have actually great data on the use of specific agents. And so you mentioned the uh, rivaroxaban, uh, 2.5 milligrams actually is the dose that has been studied particularly um, in this population. So rivaroxaban traditionally has been used as a, as a blood thinner, as an anticoagulant. Um, to treat patients with, uh, with blood clots. But um, uh, more recently, it has actually been studied in patients with peripheral artery disease, and specifically in those who have both peripheral artery disease and also coronary disease, and that was studied in the COMPASS trial. And um, what they found was actually a significant benefit in the use of the rivaroxaban at a dose of 2.5 milligrams in conjunction with aspirin. Um, and particularly, the benefit was shown in patients who had disease in multiple beds. So for example, a patient with coronary and peripheral uh, vascular disease. So that is something that um, I have seen more providers use. I personally use in my practice. Um, and, um, and so it's, it's, a great, it's a great tool to have in our toolbox. I just wonder as we sort of come to the close on the medications, I think we're almost exhausting the amount of medical therapy we're offering, but you can see that there's a lot more available now than there was even six years ago. Dr. Nanjandapa, um, patients who've got narrowing in arteries in the leg, they've gone to Dr. Laffin, they've gone through supervised exercise training, they're still with severe pain. There's another class of medications that we sometimes use called the phosphodiesterase inhibitors. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. I wonder if you could 
briefly tell us a little bit about your experience with that and then maybe segue into what your experience has been when they failed supervised exercise training, they failed maximum medical therapy that may include a phosphodiesterase inhibitor. How do patients feel if they've had a stent placed in the appropriate area to restore blood flow? Do their symptoms disappear or do you find that you can sometimes use that phosphodiesterase inhibitor to prevent them using a procedure? Uh, that's a great question, Dr. Cameron. I think from the beginning when I see a patient with peripheral arterial disease, especially if it's SFA disease, we do start them on the phosphodiesterase inhibitor. The main thing is the silostozole, which is also called pletol. The doses come in 100 milligrams twice a day. Sometimes the patient says, I've tried before, I can't tolerate. Sometimes they get a little bit of diarrhea and they have a, symptoms of heart failure. Then I may go down to 50 BID. The absolute classic contraindication for silostrozole is patients who are symptomatic with heart failure with class 3, class 4. If they're not symptomatic, I tend to give them the same dose of 100 BID and tell them you may have some GI soft stool or GI upset, but most can tolerate. And majority will tolerate. And the trials, what they showed is if you treat them with 100 BID, it takes about eight weeks to kick in. And then one more ma month, maybe at 12 weeks, they start to see the difference. And then the curves separate and compared to medical treatment, they really do good. But if you drop off or you stop, then the curves come back. And phosphodiesterase inhibitor is a great example to say it's just not about thinning the blood a little bit. It produces body on TPA. It's got a vasodilatory effect, <clears throat> antithrombotic effect, so multiple benefits. And the claudication distance, if I remember the trials, it went from 100 meters to at least 150 meters. So you're doubling the one, one and a half times the excess capacity. But sometimes they don't tolerate. Sometimes if it's an iotoiliac disease, despite um, pletol, they don't, um, they're not able to achieve what they want to do. And for each person, claudication is different. For somebody who's a couch potato, maybe he can't get out of the uh, sofa to walk to the bathroom. That's his lifestyle limitation versus a person who was running marathons. For him, if he can't walk 100 meters, that may be lifestyle limitation. And depending upon the work the person does, we just had recently seen a patient who lays the tar on the street and he can't put the coal on the street to make the tar roads. So for him, the limitation may be more aggressive. So for such patients, we do offer angioplasty and stent. There's a wide range of uh, treatment that's available and sometimes we differ each other in how we um, see which is the best option. In my opinion, patients can get a balloon angioplasty, it's very safe, and we have the medicated balloons called the drug eluting balloons. Their patency is almost or even better than a bare metal stent. So we treat with the balloon angioplasty followed by a drug eluting balloon with a long inflation results. You have a better patency of the artery, better resolution of the symptoms. We're talking about above the knee. Below knee, we don't have much data on the drug eluting balloon. If the balloon angioplasty fails repeatedly or there is a longer area of dissection, then maybe stents but in terms of stents, I try to shy away from the areas of common femoral artery. That's an area, it's like a very easily treatable by surgery. Also, when the patients bend down, it may cr cr crush. Arteries behind the kneecap is not best treated with stent unless it's really needed. So forgoing these two areas, most of them can be treated with a stent. And with the drug eluting balloon, Cleveland Clinic led a lot of the clinical trials. The patency anywhere can be between 74% to up to 89%. When you compare that with the balloon angioplasty itself, in large meta-analysis can be as low as 42% to 60, 70%. So you have an added benefit of 10 to 20% just by drug eluting balloon. If it's short segment and then you stent, you can get up the patency up to 80 to 90%, but stents, when they go down, it's trouble. So we still try to avoid putting stents unless it's really needed, especially for the scenario we explained claudication. Balloon angioplasty is probably good. Well. Just in closing, Dr. Quartramoni, I wonder if you could um, give us a little bit of your experience with the collaborations that we've had in Cleveland Clinic. So one of the things we're really blessed with in the Heart, um, Vascular and Thoracic Institute is multidisciplinary care. And I know certainly I've had this situation and so have some of my peers. A patient has been referred to vascular medicine that clearly needs imminent surgical intervention. But that's okay because we're very collaborative and similarly, Vascular medicine offers the doctor of the day consultation line and sometimes there's a very medically complex patient and you've gotten them over to us. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about your experience with this cross-collaboration that we have? 
This is a very unique feature of Cleveland Clinic, having access to such a wide variety of talented uh, colleagues. Uh, and it really makes, uh, it makes it a pleasure to work uh, with, with everyone, particularly for patients where they may be driving three or four hours to see you know, m me or maybe they came into your office and we realized, hey, we need, we need another opinion here. We need to kind of sort the situation out. I think having that option where we can just literally call up and say, hey, can you squeeze this patient in, into your office? They can walk right down the hall and kind of get the care that they need in an expedited fashion. Uh, in the outpatient setting, if it's something that's you know, more urgent, I, you know, we can bring them into the hospital and engage everybody on the inpatient side as well. But just having that as an option, I think, um, makes me, you know, at least reassures me that we can get the people that we need in a timely fashion uh, in that setting. Okay, well, just to wrap up, I'd just like to thank you for joining us this evening to talk about uh, peripheral artery disease. And uh, once again, just to uh, identify Dr. Luke Laffin from the section of preventive cardiology offers many things for risk factor reduction as well as supervised exercise training. Dr. Wu from vascular medicine um, offers comprehensive screening as well as imaging as well as maximum use of antithrombotic medication. Dr. Nanjan Dapa um, is also a cardiologist and offers percutaneous intervention. And then Dr. Quartermoney um, sort of wears the crown jewel because he's able to do all things, uh, medical management, uh, percutaneous intervention, uh, as well as uh, surgical management. Thank you so much for joining us.